Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending. Today we're going to discuss some of the pains that we had in our Puppet environment, how we tried to take some community open source tools to try and add some safety to that Puppet environment, and how you all might be able to benefit from that work. This is our Puppet unit testing story. To start, we'd like to introduce ourselves. We're two software engineers from Box. In case you're not familiar, Box is a modern content management platform that transforms how organizations work and collaborate to achieve results faster. We'll store your files safely in the cloud and allow you to access them anywhere using our various web apps, mobile apps, and desktop applications. We also have a rich API for developers to build their own apps on top of their own content. My name is Jordan. I'm an engineer on the desktop team. I don't work in Puppet day to day, but I have done a decent amount trying to set up uh, CI machines for my team. And I also spent a few months on rotation with the ops team to work on this unit testing project. Hi, my name is Nadim. I'm a software engineer on the productivity engineering team. I was pre previously part of the ops team at Box, where I got a chance to work heavily with Puppet. The main idea of this talk is unit testing monolithic Puppet repositories. Or, if you prefer, you might think of it as a spaghetti repository if your code is all jumbled and disorganized. Now, not all monolithic repositories are spaghetti. It's definitely possible to have a well-organized and structured monolith. But today, we're mostly going to focus on the disorganized. So when we talk about a spaghetti monolith, some characteristics that might come to mind is you might have a bunch of modules that are heavily interconnected with each other. These modules might have no specifications to them. The repository probably grew organically, started small, and tacking features on as quickly as possible over time. And a big one is that your business logic is probably spread throughout your code base. In such a monolith, because of all these characteristics, it can be difficult to write new code safely, and it can also be difficult to test that code. At Box, we had the problem where, as we grew organically from startup phase, our puppet code grew into this chaotic mess that is somewhat dangerous to work in. So we wanted to try and bring some safety that, to that environment using uh, automated testing. So uh, what will we talk about today? To set the stage, we will talk about the extensive and important nature of how puppet is used at Box. We will then explain why we chose to invest in unit testing rather than other types of testing. After that, we'll show you how to get started with our spec puppet. Just a brief disclaimer here, this talk is not a tutorial on our spec puppet or puppet unit testing. If you're looking for a tutorial, you'll have to consult other online resources. We'll only show you a couple examples just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. After that, we'll discuss some of the challenges and problems we ran into when trying to make our spec puppet work with our puppet monolith. We'll also share the solutions that we came up with to solve those problems. If you have a monolith with a lot of spaghetti code, it'll make it much easier for you to get started with puppet unit testing. This will be followed by a discussion on how we set up a CI system for our, our puppet code base. We are now able to run our, all of our tests in a fast and efficient manner on every change. We will show you how we got there. Finally, we'll discuss some of the challenges we're having in fully rolling this project out to the entire engineering organization. So Puppet is heavily used at Box. It is used to manage and configure almost all of our production server servers. I will share some numbers that will highlight its vastness. First, we have more than 8,000 agent nodes that are managed with Puppet. In addition to that, we have more than 300 individual modules that are managed with Puppet. So these are not your like, Forge-esque proper component modules. Often, these are modules interdependent on many other modules and very spaghettified. To show you some of the like, chaotic nature of a Puppet code base, we, we have more than 200 changes going out to the Puppet repository every week. And per month, on average, we have 115 different committers. 
that are committing code to the Puppet repository. This also sort of highlights sort of our DevOps nature. We have a lot of people from the dev side committing code to the Puppet repository, as well as people from the ops side. So ensuring that Puppet is correct is critical for our business. And, and this is due to like how much of our pu production infrastructure is managed with Puppet. And due to the chaotic nature of our, our Puppet setup, um, it is also very difficult. So let's talk about why we chose to invest in unit testing. To start with, I will take you through the a manual testing process that a box engineer follows to test their puppet change. This is before they push their change up for review. This is when they want to verify that the change is what, is what they expect. So first, they'll commit their change to Git. After that, they'll push up their branch using a standard git push command. This will, uh, at this point, there will be a post receive hook that will run um, and deploy their branch as a separate Puppet environment on all the Puppet masters using R10K. This process can take anywhere up to a minute. So at this point, their code is on all the Puppet masters. They pick a test machine to test their change. So naturally, they will SSH into the test machine. Once they're on the test machine, they can finally run Puppet and validate that the change is what they expect. And running Puppet can take anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, depending on what type of node you're on. So you can already see the inherent flaws in this process. Even if there is a one character typo, the developer has to, to validate that if they, correct, if they corrected the typo, they'll have to start this process from the beginning again. And this might have to be repeated multiple times till they get it right. I want to talk a little more about that last step on the previous slide. Now, running Puppet is not simply a one-step process. Once you are running Puppet on a test machine, you first have to ensure that the catalog is compiled successfully. This alone can take minutes. After that, initially you want to run Puppet in no-op mode first. You want to see the changes that Puppet says it will apply and accept them. If all looks good, you want to run Puppet in normal mode and finally wait for that to complete. And after that, you can finally review the state of the machine. And if there are failures at any point in this process, you have to start over from the beginning. This is a very time-consuming process for all of our engineers. Just that time to push the code up to all the puppet masters and then bring it back down again and have the, the catalog compilation happen, that's the minimum amount of time that it takes to detect a compilation error. And then you know, if there's a runtime error, that takes even longer to detect. We polled our box engineers a while back and asked them, how long do they spend per week testing their puppet code this way? And when the results came in, we found out that the average time was approximately three hours per week spent with this manual testing. So it was a huge loss in productivity when the engineers could have been doing something more useful with their time. Some other reasons we wanted to move away from manual testing is, has to do with, again, the monolith problem. If I want to make a change to module M, since there's a lot of spaghetti code, that module M might be used in multiple different modules, which might be used in multiple different roles, which is used in a bunch of clusters. And if I want to do my due diligence and make sure my change isn't going to break someone else's machine, I should really be uh, testing in every single cluster that's going to receive this change. It's not very easy to do. And since it's all manual, the test isn't very repeatable. So it's a process that can definitely let problems slip through accidentally. So we wanted to fix that. We identified three possible ways that we could have made the process better. One would be by improving the manual testing process. Another would be by using acceptance testing with Puppet's beaker tool. And the third way would be with unit slash integration testing. Manual testing, the only thing you can really do there is try and shrink the times that those steps take. But the testing process still has all the inherent flaws, even if it's quick. Acceptance testing, for those who aren't familiar, is kind of like the automated version of manual testing. When you make a change, you're going to run Puppet on fresh VMs for all of the affected roles, make sure that the catalog compilation succeeds, make sure that the running of Puppet succeeds, and then run some tests on the completed node to make sure it's in the proper state. This is a good endpoint to be for um, a very uh, 
an enterprise that's on top of its puppet work. But for us, this was not really something we wanted to do immediately, just because we didn't really have the infrastructure to be able to set up all of these fresh VMs um, you know, on demand. And we also thought it would take a long time just to get to a step where we could validate the technology in our system, which is why we looked to unit testing. Unit testing is very lightweight. For those who aren't familiar, the concept of unit testing is that you identify individual test units and you test them in isolation from the rest of the system. In traditional programming, you would take, say, a public method or a public class, and you would write tests for that without all the other context of the program. That allows you to write tests that run incredibly quickly because they're not running through the whole program state. And you can also get really specific with your tests. And so we wanted to see if we could take unit testing and get those speed gains in the Puppet world. Now, I say slash integration testing because since we're in a monolith, it's incredibly hard to separate out an individual component and have it run in isolation because that manifest might pull another manifest, another manifest. So it's really more similar to unit integration testing, which tests a little bit more area than unit testing does. One other thing to say about unit testing before we move on is that it doesn't totally solve the manual testing problem because with the unit tests, you can only run tests on the catalog and what is contained in a compiled catalog. So for actually verifying that the runtime works and that the machines aren't affected, you still have to rely on manual testing. But at least we get some quicker feedback and we get some of the process automated. So when we started out this project, we defined a few goals to, mar to track our progress. First, we wanted to make sure that our tests would be able to run automatically and quickly, as this was one of the main drawbacks of our manual trust testing process. We also wanted to make sure that our system would work for most of our Puppet files. Otherwise, there's no point in maintaining a system that doesn't work for the majority of your code base. We also wanted our system to be able to catch bugs quickly and report feedback to users on code review. This would prevent bugs from going out to production a lot quicker. Finally, the last one is more of a social change. We wanted to eventually have developers write tests with their Puppet code. So in this way, our system could continue to evolve, and our co coverage could keep increasing. So now let's take a look how we got started. We're going to see how we investigated the tool to see if it would work. And we're going to go through a very quick example of what this will look like in your environment. Of course, we're using Puppet. Um, at the time, we were using Puppet 3.6. We're using another tool from Puppet called Puppet Lab Spec Helper. This is a suite of utilities that makes it easier to uh, set up fixtures for Puppet tests and, in general, makes it possible to run your unit test suite along with the latter tools. Next, there's RSpec, which is a popular Ruby unit testing library. In general, the RSpec library is typically used for testing Ruby code, executable Ruby code. Uh, with the Puppet manifest, in order to test that, we needed to pull in this last tool called RSpec Puppet, which is an extension to RSpec, which allows you to write assertions about catalog compilation. To get started, we had to define some files into our Puppet repo first. We created a file called rakefile, which just does an import from the Puppet Lab spec helper. This defines various entry points that you can uh, run commands on the command line to start up the test suite. We also added a fixtures.yaml file in order to tell Puppet Lab Spec Helper where to find the modules that we want to test. This file is broken up into two sections. One section is a list of paths to modules in the repo itself so that Puppet Lab Spec Helper can set up the fixtures to those modules. And the spec helper also works with R10K modules. So if you have component repos that are stored elsewhere, you can give the uh, git path and the version number, and the spec helper will clone those at the start of testing. Finally, we have to actually tell our spec puppet some configuration items in the spec helper.rb file. And just as an example, at the bottom here, you can see us telling our spec puppet where to find the manifest directory 
and where to find the modules directory. And these are passed on to Puppet at compilation time. So let's write a test. Let's say I have a module foo in my repository. And inside that module, we have a class called bar. In our repository, we've created a directory called spec slash classes, which is going to contain all of the tests for every class that we want to test. Then we created a subdirectory for all the tests for the foo module. And finally, for the bar class, we created bar underscore spec dot rb. In general, all the tests that we write are going to go into files with the suffix underscore spec dot rb. Then we have the test itself, which is broken up into a few components. At the top, we have an import of the spec helper we defined on the previous slide. This makes sure that all of the configurations we've defined take effect when running this test. Next, this describe line tells our spec puppet which manifests we're testing. In this case, we're testing foo colon colon bar. When the tests actually run, our spec puppet is going to do a puppet compilation, which is rooted at this manifest. So compilation is going to start from that manifest. Inside the Ruby do block, we write all of the tests that we want for this manifest. In this case, we're only showing one test. But in general, you could put as many into this file as you want. And finally, there's the tests themselves. This is the simplest test that you can write in our spec puppet. It should compile. As it sounds, this is a test that the catalog compilation succeeds. So when this test runs, Puppet compilation is going to start with this manifest. And then when compilation succeeds, our spec Puppet is going to check the status. If the compilation was a success, the test passes. If the compilation failed at any point, the test is going to report a failure to the test runner. This is the simplest kind of test that you can write with RSpec Puppet, but it's by no means the only one. In general, you can write a test that makes assertions about any part of the generated catalog. So you can write tests that certain resources were included or excluded from the catalog. You can test that resources that were included have certain attributes with certain values. And you can also test relationships between resources that were included in the catalog. You can also be more specific about the kind of test that you're writing. So you can tell RSpec Puppet when the test runs with Puppet, you can specify what the facts on this test environment should be. Or if it's a class or define that takes inputs, you can specify the parameters that are supposed to be passed to it. In order to run the tests, we take advantage of that rake file that we defined earlier. And on the command line, we can just type the command rake space spec. And that's going to run all of the tests in the test suite. If you want to be more specific, there's also commands to run all the tests in a specific directory. Or if you're writing just one test file at the time, you can run tests for a single test file. Here's what it looks like to run the tests. We go to the command line. We type our rake spec command, and then it starts running. At this point, Puppet Lab spec helper is cloning all of our R10K modules and setting up our other fixtures. And then it runs all the tests and reports the success or failure. As you can see here, in two seconds, we were able to run eight tests. So we were able to make eight different assertions about catalog compilation in our various manifests that we were testing in this directory. By comparison, if we were doing manual testing, it would have taken us minutes in order to get this test feedback. So this is very clearly a powerful tool for our developers in order to know early on whether or not their manifests are working the way that they expect. So this works. Yay, we can go home. Um, not really. Uh, we found that while we could test very simple manifests with this setup, it would actually fail for various reasons when testing most of the things. As we saw back when Nadim was talking in our goals checklist, our number one priority for this project was that this needed to actually work for most files in our repository. And that's for two reasons. One is that in order to get the technical benefits, it needs to actually work. If it's only going to work on a very small number of things, there's no point in investing time into it. And also, 
for developers, you want developers to actually go and write tests. And if they know that 90% of the time, if they sit down to write a test, it's not going to work, they're obviously never going to write tests. So we really needed to tackle some of these problems. And so that leads us to our next portion. We're going to talk about a few of the problems that we encountered with this setup and what we identified as the problem and how we went about fixing that. Just a quick aside, all of the content that we're talking about today we've put on GitHub so that others can use it as well. So you can go to github.com slash jmoldow slash box spec helper. And that contains all of the code we're going to talk about today and more. And so the hope is that someone could copy all of the code and paste it into their own repository and hopefully get set up with the unit testing much quicker than we were able to. So let's go through a few of those problems. The first one we ran into was a problem of undefined facts. So by default, when RSpec Puppet runs, it leaves most of the facts unspecified. However, in our monolith, we found that because the business logic was spread all over the place, so were our use of facts. So a lot of manifests make use of facts. And so if you're testing a manifest and it encounters a fact and that fact isn't defined, chances are the uh, compilation is either going to fail outright, or you might go down a different code path that you, than you intended. And so neither of those things are good. So we wanted it so that the facts would actually be defined in the average case. We found that our spec puppet has a configuration that you can set in order to tell it to run with more default facts in your runs. So Going back to the spec helper file, there's a configuration called default facts, and we can pass it a mapping of various facts to tell it what to run with. In this case, we found what the most common facts in our particular monolith were, and we gave them same defaults. So in this example, you can see we set the architecture and the host name and a few other things. And in general, you could set whatever the most common facts in your repository are. Now, these are just defaults. In general, when you're running a manifest, you want to set the facts that make the most sense for the test that you're running. And this doesn't stop you from doing that. Our spec puppet still lets you, in your test, specify facts that are more specific to that test. So you can still do that. These are just sane defaults, so that if you're sitting down to write a test and you don't want to worry about the facts, that it'll just work probably, without you having to worry about it too much. The second problem we ran into was with required attributes. So in Puppet resources, there are typically one or more required attributes that you have to specify in order for the catalog compilation to succeed. In the example of the exec resource, you always need to specify the path. But in Puppet, you can also specify a default path using a resource collector, like in the snapshot at the top. So this tells Puppet that if a path isn't specified, to just use that one. So in production, that exec command that we show at the bottom compiles just fine. It just uses the default. But in our test environment, it wasn't picking up the resource collectors that were setting the defaults. So when the test ran, it would complain that one of the required attributes was missing. So we had this situation where compilation would succeed in production, but it would fail in the test environment. In order to have a good testing infrastructure, we wanted them to both pass. In um, at Box, we found that all of our default resource collectors were stored in our manifests site.pp file. So what we did was we actually just created a symlink from the fixtures directory and created a site.pp file there that symlinked back to the production site.pp file. Um, this might vary depending on you know, what you have in your site.pp file and where your resource collectors are located. But this worked for us in order to pull in those defaults into our test environment. One of the trickier problems we ran into had to do with custom functions. So Puppet allows you to define functions in Ruby code 
that you can stick into your Puppet manifests and run at compilation time to produce some value. When we started testing, what we discovered was that there were some functions that would always fail in the test environment. Digging into it a little more, we found that the reason for that was because there were some functions that could only succeed in production. And that was for various reasons. For example, we had some Puppet functions that were querying uh, production data stores for the Puppet Masters, or some that were accessing files that only existed on the Puppet Masters. For security reasons, we obviously weren't going to take these production secrets and put them into the test environment. But it was still very important that we solve this problem. Uh, and the reason for that is, A, we want to make sure that we can test these files. Again, we didn't want any file using one of these functions to be untestable. Furthermore, remember again that we're in this spaghetti monolith. So if I have a, fun uh, if I have a manifest that uses a production-only function, I can't test that manifest. Furthermore, if I have other manifests that import that manifest, the function's going to run when compiling, ma compiling Puppet for any of those. So all those manifests are also untestable, and so on and so forth. So this made it so that a large swaths of our repository couldn't be tested. What we wanted to do was, in or was to be able to define stub functions that we could substitute out the production function for a fake one. This, again, is showing how what we're doing is really more similar to integration testing rather than unit testing. What we wanted was to identify all of the production-only functions in our code base and write stubs for them. That way, a developer doesn't have to worry about whether their manifest is including a production-only function or is including a manifest which is including a production-only function, or so on and so forth. But of course, we didn't want to modify the production functions. We wanted to leave them as is. Our spec puppet doesn't have a solution for this currently, but we were able to figure out a solution of our own by taking advantage of Puppet's module path feature. So depending on your environment, you may not be aware of this, but um, you don't have to just have a single location for your modules. You can actually specify multiple different locations. It's similar to the path variable on a computer where when you have a command that you want to look up on the command line, it'll check each directory in turn until it finds that command. Similarly, with Puppet's module path, if you specify multiple different directories and you have a module lookup or a function lookup, it's going to check each of those locations one at a time until it finds it, and then it's going to abort early. So in this case, in production, we just have our modules directory, but in the test environment, we're going to have two directories. In front of the modules directory, we're actually going to have a directory that we called override modules. And you can ex see an example file directory tree where we have our real modules at the bottom and our override modules at the top. And just to highlight those in red, those are the two locations in the module path. Well, let's walk through two examples of how this works. Let's say I have a manifest that calls a function called simple func, which we assume works both in production and in testing. Simple func, we're only going to define once in the place where it was always defined in our Puppet repository. So when we're doing the lookup, it's only located under the modules directory. So when Puppet compilation is looking for it, it's just going to look for it in there, find it, and use that one. Now let's say we have a different manifest we're testing, which uses another function called prodfunc. And we assume that this function only works in production and not in the test environment. In this case, we're actually going to define prodfunc twice, once in the place it's always been in our Puppet code base, but another one under the override modules. So now we have two places in the uh, module path which have definitions of this function. When we're searching the module path, the first one is actually going to win out over the second one since it's earlier in the module path, and then we get the stub function rather than the real one. And just to show what a stub function might look like, we might define a function that barely does anything at all other than asserting that the inputs are as expected and then returning some dummy value that works. And hopefully with this dummy value, 
uh, the compilation is going to su succeed and do something that approximately looks correct. Those are the only RSpec Puppet things we have time to talk about today before we get into our CI section. But that's not the only stuff we did. You can find more of this in the repository. But we did some work around auto-generating simple it should compile tests. That way, we can get some quick test coverage for our repository. We also had to work around some warts in the RSpec library and make it easier to define facts and parameters. And finally, since our test environment was Linux only, but we do run some Windows deployments at Box, we also needed a way in order to emulate the Windows environment so that we could write tests for Windows manifests. So, so let's switch gears. So we've got a decent amount of tests, and um, we have a unit testing framework. Now, how do we get more people to write tests? How do we make sure that the tests are always running? I will discuss our continuous integration. To start out, we defined a small beta testers group. We, we, we defined a puppet task force that would sort of like spearhead this, this project forward. And we just asked people to join this group, and we configured that using a simple feature flip mechanism where we could add more users in the regex. Now, for these users, what we did was every time they pushed up a puppet change, we reported test feedback. We ran the entire unit testing suite and reported feedback on it. So if none of the tests failed after they pushed their change, they would get a plus one from the test result user in Garrett. If, however, their change caused tests to fail, they would get feedback for it. They could review the, the failures and push up a new patch set. This first iteration also allowed us to iterate on our framework and add more tests. We also wanted our Puppet Task Force or Better Testers group to write new tests and to continue to evolve the framework. So great, we've got these tests that are running on for, for our Better Testers group. What's the problem? Well, we realized that the tests actually take a very long time. They take six to eight minutes to run, as you can see here. So we had nearly 400 tests running for, for every patch set that was pushed up, but they were very slow. What we wanted was to be, to be on the order of seconds. As Jordan showed earlier, that when he ran the eight tests, that they took only two seconds. That was our ultimate goal. So what we did was we decided to use a tool called Cluster Runner. This tool is able to take an individual test unit distribute it in parallel, and run, aggregate the results and report feedback. This was written by the Box Productivity Engineering team, and it is open source. You can learn more about it on clusterowner.com. It also comes with visualization add-ons. And the cool thing to note here is that you can set up Cluster Runner to run tests for more than just your Puppet unit tests. You can use it to run your PHP tests, your Python tests, or whatever you, you like. So here, it's just the illustration showing how Cluster Runner allocates its slaves. To make it very easy for you to install Cluster Runner, we also open sourced a Puppet module. So now you can set up a Cluster Runner with just a few lines of Puppet code. This is available on the Forge, as you can see here. So the key to using Cluster Runner is what, what Cluster Runner refers to as a, as a concept of an atomizer. Well, you need to tell it how you want to distribute your individual test unit. What we realized was, as Jordan mentioned earlier, that all of our, our unit test files end with the suffix underscore spec dot rb. And you can find all your underscore spec dot rb files using this find command. This is what an output will look like. So each, each file here is your individual test unit. And we can tell Cluster Runner to run these tests using one of these rake spec commands. In particular, the last one where you can specify the individual test file. So great. We'll ask Cluster Runner to run tests by figuring out individual atoms and then using this command. Unfortunately, when we first ran this, we ran into a bunch of failures that we weren't seeing when running the tests in serial. What was going on was that the command that we used to run the tests, rake spec, was actually composed of three subcommands. First of these subcommands, rake spec prep, actually created fixtures, all the fixtures that were defined in the fixtures.yaml file. The second rake spec command, rake spec clean, deleted any fixtures that were present on the file system. So what was happening was these tests would start up in parallel. There would be a, a, a fixtures directory present. 
Now, one of the tests would finish first, and it would remove the fixtures directory. So the remaining tests that were still running would all fail. What we needed was the third command that rake spec is composed of, rake spec standalone. This assumes that the fixtures directory is already present and simply to just run the test. So if, when we were starting out to run our test in parallel, we could first set up the fixtures directory using rake spec prep and, tear it, and at the end tear it down with rake spec clean. But all the, all the tests would assume that the fixtures directory is already present. Cluster Runner comes built in with this exact concept. In the setup build section of your clusterrunner.yaml file, you can specify how to set up your build. Here you can use rake spec prep. In the teardown section, you can use rake spec clean to delete the fixtures directory. And you can use the actual command to run the test. Here again, we just see the how to define the atomizer section, how to tell Cluster Runner to find your individual test unit. The last setting here is the max executors per slave setting. This just tells Cluster Runner to, to distribute 15 different tests in parallel on one individual slave. So if you have 10 different Cluster Runner slaves running in your environment and 15 tests per slave, you will have 150 tests all running in parallel at the same time. This Cluster Runner.yaml file is also available on the block spec helper, helper on GitHub. So great, now we've got these tests running and we realized a, a large gain. Initially, when we were running our tests in serial, our time was 420 seconds or seven minutes. When we used cluster runner to run our tests, it came down to a mere 20 seconds. And this also allowed us to figure out what our slowest test was, since that would be our bottleneck. We had all of our tests running in parallel. So this allowed us to, make, to decrease the time for that test and actually see gains on our entire testing suite. So our workflow looks like this. A developer executes git push to the git remote server. At that point, a post receive git hook is triggered in the background and runs asynchronously. What it does is it makes an API call to cluster runner to run the tests. It continuously pulls cluster runner and receives the test results. After it receives the test results, it just simply posts a state to Jenkins. It tells Jenkins whether the build is healthy or unhealthy. That's the only, that's the only the, the Jenkins use is just to keep the state of the build. So if the build is healthy, we'll have a, a Jenkins job that will just tell us that the build is green. And if the build is unhealthy, that, that Jenkins job is marked red. This allows us an easy way to figure out what the current state of our Puppet build is. OK, I'll now talk about some of the challenges we're facing in rolling this out to completion. In particular, we have a couple of roadblocks that are preventing us from rolling this out engineering-wide. Currently, we do not post test feedback on code review for all of our developers. We only do that for beta testers. The reason for that is we're not using cluster runner to run tests on code review. We're only running, using cluster runner to run tests post-merge. Once we use cluster runner to run tests on our code review, we can also provide feedback for all, all developers every time they push their changes up for review. This will allow us to roll it out engineering-wide. The second problem is that our post-merge test results are not readily available. So if a developer merges a change and it causes the build to go red, for them to figure out why the change failed, they'll have to run rake spec locally. This is obviously is preventing us from rolling this out completely. Once we clear these roadblocks, we can move forward with this project. The good thing about Cluster Runner is it also comes with another add-on that allows you to see this test output very easily. If any of your individual items failed, it'll show up like this, and you can click on it to see the full output. So we started from a place where we were working in this very chaotic puppet monolith with lots of spaghetti code. And we saw that the manual testing process was not sufficient for our needs and also a huge drain on productivity. So we embarked on this project to see, can we make things better with unit testing? What we're happy to report is that even though the project isn't 100% complete, a lot of the very technical roadblocks have been solved. The remaining problems that we have are mostly just we need to get resourcing to finish the project. But we were happy to see that our tests could run quickly and automatically, and we could write tests for most files. And just in general, that this unit testing technology, which was mainly created for well-designed components, could also be used on a larger scale for your Puppet monolith. 
again, we have all the code available online on GitHub. And we'd be happy if people are having similar problems, if they take the code and try it out and see how well it works for them. Um, some possible future work is some of this stuff could potentially be upstreamed to our spec puppet or to Puppet Lab spec helper. Or if the need exists to keep it as a standalone project, we could potentially create a Ruby gem for it so that other people can install it more easily. So we're just going to leave that URL up there if people want to write it down and visit it later. Here's our contact information in case you want to email us after the talk. But it does look like we do have a few minutes for questions. So thank you a lot for attending. Um, have you refactored your code into using the roles and profiles pattern, or is it really jumbly and spaghetti? <laughs> We've and done how it. How does that work with the testing side? Yeah. So for the roles and profiles, since the roles and profiles tend to pull in so much code, those are the manifests that tend to be the hardest to test because it can take minutes to compile them. So we tend to not run any unit tests for those. Um, that's more of the thing where we probably would still need manual testing or acceptance testing for. We do have some use of roles and profiles. The, the, the quality and organization of it is sort of mixed. We have done some refactoring. There, there are other projects at Box besides this one to try and make our use of Puppet better. So a little bit, but not a lot. Um, but most of the testing takes place in the modules, not the roles and profiles. Um, great talk. Uh, totally relevant. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, 100% relevant. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one um, is, now of course I have the mic in my hand, I'm blanking on that one. <laughs> I wrote the other ones down though. Um, in the beginning you said, um, uh, so, oh, okay, I just remember the first one. So um, when you say that your puppet code base is monolithic, do you mean that every agent node gets your entire puppet wallop? So uh, we have a master agent set up. Yeah. So all of our masters have our entire code base. Um, but like that's using R10K. So what I mean when I say monolith is that a lot of our modules are interdependent on other modules, and they're all contained in one repository. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, I guess on the whole monolithic, I'll, this will be my last question, on the whole monolithic topic, you mentioned in the beginning about one um, negative characteristic that typifies a spaghetti monolithic environment is having business logic everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite certain that's how ours is. But um, I just <laughs> wondered if you could, I guess I'm trying to figure it out. Um, so can you say more about that, what that looks like? Is that related to having a messy console? I don't, if you can s elaborate on that, that'd be great. So we're probably not the best people to speak about this, um, but we can try and get into it. So if you go online and if you look up the roles and profiles and modules pattern, typically what's recommended is the business logic goes into the profile. So the profiles defines a lot of what pieces of your environment are going to look like. And the modules are typically reusable components. So you could think of a module as something that you could open source. So something simple like setting up Java, setting up Python, setting, <coughs> sorry, setting up Jenkins. So some reusable component with logic that only applies to it and not to the, peculi <coughs> the peculiarities of your particular environment. That would all go into your profiles. But I encourage you to read more online because we're definitely not the people who could speak most eloquently about that. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Okay, thank you. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this session. So thanks a lot, Nadim and Josh. Jordan, sorry.